Welcome to the final video in this trilogy where we analyse the lost stories of the Troughton era and discuss whether I would have preferred any of them to the stories we actually got on screen. And the answer I've reached so far for the majority of them, well pretty much all of them, is... uh, Not really? But who knows, that might turn around for this video. I mean, season 6 has by far the most promising lost story ideas. So, um, let's get started, shall we? Firstly, there's The Dream Spinner, an outing by Paul Wheeler intended to be the fourth serial of the run, with the plot apparently concerning the titular entity being capable of making others believe that their dreams are real. First being conceived as a four-parter and then being extended to six, the story did reach some form of scripting, whether it was an episode one draft or like a scene-by-scene -scene breakdown, I don't know, I couldn't find out the specifics. Uh, but it was ultimately rejected for either budgetary reasons or I guess the production team just didn't like what they were reading. I don't know. I couldn't confirm it. It's really unclear. Ultimately, its slot was filled by the extension of the invasion, the Crotons being bumped up to the fourth story slot instead, and with the outstanding six episode gap itself being awarded to the Space Pirates. The premise, if extremely vague, certainly sounds cool, and given how surprisingly trippy a lot of the direction in the later Troughton era could be, I imagine with the right creatives on the job it could have been executed spectacularly. I wouldn't sacrifice the invasion for it, nor particularly the Crotons, but the Space Pirates, hell yeah, it can have that slot all at once, it can't be any worse than that. Around the time of Season 6, former script editor Donald Tosh had contacted the production team to see if they were interested in a full story by him. Planned to be a four-parter called The Rose Mariners, or The Rosicrucians, it would have involved the TARDIS landing on a seemingly abandoned Earth space vessel, under siege by an escaped inmate of the nearby Rose Mariners prison vessel. The Rose Mariners use a special substance secreted from their roses to keep their criminals docile, but the escaped inmate Rogosa has stolen some of it, and is using it on his cap and the humans to brainwash his way out of captivity and ultimately gain power over the Earth. The Doctor would have saved the day by hoisting him with his own petard, so to speak, and returning him to the prison. The production team were apparently moderately interested in this idea, and so Tosh set to work writing an episode 1 script. But sadly, by the time he'd completed it, Patrick Troughton and the rest of the team had already announced their intentions to leave and that the show's format was to be drastically overhauled. So Tosh had no choice but to set his unmade story to rest. That is, until it was eventually legitimised in the form of a Big Finish audio, with Tosh himself returning to script it and convert it to a different medium. Fraser Hines and Wendy Padbury reprise their roles for this project, and Clive Wood and David Warner portray Rugosa and scientist character Arnold Biggs respectively, both of them doing serviceable work here if I do say so myself. Tosh brings his unmade story to life pretty vividly, describing character actions and environmental aspects so clearly that I have almost no problem trying to visualise it as a regular 60s serial, and he captures that 60s charm and the personalities of our three leads quite superbly. The adventure also has a handful of subversive versions which are played pretty well, particularly when a supposed drugged up criminal turns out to actually be the governor of the Rose Marinus prison, who was overcome by Ragosa. And there's also a fair amount of playful manipulation between our heroes and the antagonists, both undercover and both bluffing and hoping for the best, which was very fun to experience and witness how it would play out. There's a couple of nice and relatively well justified callbacks to some first Doctor Dalek outings here as well, which feel quite natural given Tosh's previous occupation as script editor for the the Hartnell era, such as the rose plant which the chemical is secreted from having been developed by the Daleks on Kemble. I think Tosh's direct and sole involvement in writing this adaptation gives it the most authentic feel out of all of the big finish lost stories, and so I feel it's the most easily comparable when I judge whether I would have preferred it to have gone ahead into production back in the 60s. And honestly, my answer would be yes. Ultimately, as much as I love it, I wouldn't have minded the Crotons getting dropped from the Season 6 lineup in favour of this, as I feel the Rose Mariners has more meat to it and more compelling antagonists. And now... for the infamous one... Go away, little boy! The Prison in Space. Another Season 6 entry, a four-parter written by sitcom writer Dick Sharples. It concerns a... Uh... 
gender role reversal premise. Go knit yourself another pretty skirt. A planet where the males of the species are oppressed under a female dominated society. As Zoe is brainwashed into their ranks, the Doctor and Jamie are imprisoned, but over the course of the story they inspire a revolution against the matriarchy. That does it. Zoe is deprogrammed by <sighs> by being spanked on the buttocks. Jamie grabbed Zoe and before she knew what was happening, she was across his knee. So this thing came about because Peter Bryant thought that the show was becoming too serious and so he commissioned Dick Sharples to write a comedy script akin to say Dennis Spooner with the Romans. And it got distressingly close to production, like the script was completed multiple times. The reason it didn't make it through to the small screen? Fraser Hines. Season 6 was rather a hectic time for him, as he and the production team were constantly changing their minds on exactly when in the run that he would depart from the show. The script for The Prison in Space had to be hastily rewritten a few times due to Heinz's indecisiveness. At one point intended to be his departure story that would simultaneously introduce a new male companion, but this was soon scrapped. The production team were unsatisfied with Sharple's rewrites, but Sharple stubbornly refused to work on it any further, firmly believing that he had completed the work asked of him. Ultimately, it became clear that this adventure wasn't going to work out, and so it was scrapped, with the Crotons being produced in its place. And thank goodness for that, because this sounds like a god-awful idea that should never be dramatised. Oh. Oh, big finish, honey, no. Well, the story saw an audio reenactment by Big Finish, adapted to our speakers by Simon Gurrier, starring the returning Heinz and Padbury, as well as Susan Brown as Chairman Babs. <sighs> what? No! So, like, I'm not going to pin much of the blame on Gurrier, he's just adapting the material in front of him, and Heinz and Padbury do their best to elevate this material, but. This whole thing is utterly dreary and repulsive. Like, even looking at this on a structural level, this thing is so painfully by the numbers and obnoxiously padded, and I say that as someone who can stomach six, seven, even ten parters in one sitting, and not feel drained in the slightest. But literally, the only interesting thing here is... the sexism. You know, the thing that makes it utterly inexcusable? There are some lines of dialogue which vaguely gesture to the pretense of being for equality rather than male superiority, but any potential goodwill you could possibly squeeze out of this is thrown out of the window when the tale ends with Jamie literally spanking the feminism out of Zoe. Stop! Like... <sighs> no. 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 So, uh, yeah, no way in hell would I restore this thing to the timeline. This story actively makes me even more grateful for the Crotons than I ever thought I could be. And Big Finish shouldn't have even bothered adapting it. It deserved to be forgotten by the sands of time. Tears streaming down her face. Anyway. One more Brian Hales entry for season six, as at the request of producer Peter Bryant, he submitted an idea for a six part sequel and prequel to the Ice Warriors, entitled The Lords of the Red Planet. The TARDIS arrives on Mars, and the Doctor and friends encounter two races dwelling underground, the dominant Gandorians enslaving the Saurian race. The Gandorians have become dependent on some form of elixir to survive, and they are conducting eugenics experiments on their slaves to perfect the ultimate Martian life form, which the Doctor recognises the results of. They are witnesses to the origin of the Ice Warriors, and the wicked Zadur is planning on using them as an invasion force. Hale's monsters had proved relatively popular, and so he workshopped the idea of an origin story for them. But ultimately, this idea ended up being unused, as he and the production team set to work on a different Ice Warrior sequel story instead, with it turning out to be The Seeds of Death. 
Thankfully, our lords and saviors at Big Finish Productions stepped in once again to restore the initial adventure to the timeline in some capacity, with John Dorney stepping in to successfully realise and translate the concept to the audio medium. Hines and Padbury resume their roles, with Abigail Thor, Charlie Hayes, Nicholas Briggs, and Troughton's son Michael all filling in some supporting roles, and they all kill it in this adaptation. Dorney himself is a natural at writing clearly and effectively for the non-visual realm, so it should be no surprise that he does a split splendid job in bringing this premise to life. Zadur is granted with a super sadistic and arrogant demeanour that makes her highly engaging, and the scientist Quendrel's distraught hesitance to submit to her demands was quite compelling material, as was the plight of Aslor, the first successful Ice Lord experiment, who kind of has a cliché but sweet all the same story arc where he defects to the hero side because Zoe showed him compassion. And of course, I dare say this story fully justifies the initially commissioned six-part format, as this adaptation flies by. But again, I say that as a person who honestly enjoys a good old six-parter. That said, part of me does understand why this particular story never made it to the small screen, because oh my goodness is this thing ambitious. Not only are the Doctor, Jamie, and Zoe the only truly humanoid characters in the entire narrative, meaning all of the other actors involved would have needed significant prosthetic or costuming work applied to them if they were in a visual medium, but this story also has large crowd scenes, trips down the mines, a huge rocket, explosions, and literally a whole city collapsing into the ground. 60s Who was very good at utilising its budgetary limitations to its advantage, but yeah, no way in hell could it have been able to pull off a story this grandiose. Plus, not gonna lie, I think this tale works better with the context of the Seeds of Death, as with that outing, it feels like the Ice Warriors had built up enough staying power to truly justify the existence of an origin story, so I don't think I'd have had the Lords of the Red Planet replacing it. I guess I wouldn't have minded it replacing the Space Pirates, but then there'd be two Ice Warrior stories back to back, and that might be a bit repetitive? Uh, as much as it pains me to say it, the Lost Stories range is probably the best place for it. Another season 6 idea which ended up getting canned was The Eye in Space. Intended to be scripted by Victor Pemberton, it was basically going to be exactly what it says on the tin. There's an eye in space, except it's octopoid in nature and it has its own gravitational pull. Producer Peter Bryant, impressed by Pemberton's work on Fury from the Deep, asked him to brainstorm another story idea for a future serial. However, when the news filtered through that Bryant was going to step down from the producer role relatively soon, Pemberton decided to let the idea go, so it became lost to time. I imagine the story would have taken on quite a mysterious Lovecraftian vibe, maybe with a pinch of the giddy excitement of space exploration that some of the actual broadcast season 6 adventures have, but other than that, I can't really fathom what else it would have entailed. It's… something. Peter Ling was contemplating supplying us with another offering for Season 6. Although the potential story wasn't given a name, it was discussed between Ling and script editor Terence Dix as an adventure where the Doctor arrives on a planet where time runs backwards. The idea was tossed around a bit, but it soon became clear that it was too ambitious of a premise to pull off with the remaining budget that they had, and I think I'm forced to agree. They should do something like it nowadays though, that'd be interesting. The Aliens in the Blood was another discarded idea dreamed up for Season 6, by beloved Classic Who mainstay Robert Holmes. The premise would have revolved around a station based in the Indian Ocean, which exists to regulate spacecraft traffic much to the ire of the, quote, primitive natives. The TARDIS crew would turn up to find the station sabotaged, with the suspects initially being said natives, but it turning out to have been actually caused by superhuman mutants with ESP powers, extra fingers, and a coldly emotionless determination for world domination. The Doctor would end up defeating them by, conveniently, constructing a device which eliminates their superhuman abilities. Holmes submitted this idea after completing work on the Crotons, but Terence Dix turned it down on the grounds of similarities to the Wheel in Space, as well as other TV shows of the time. I just like to add that this sounds like a terrible, overblown idea that would have aged horribly, and I'm glad it was thrown out. Still, if you liked the sound of that for some reason, Holmes later adapted it into a non-Doctor Who related radio drama which I've not heard. And it's six episodes long, so we could probably reasonably assume that the Doctor Who version would have been a similar length. William Ems did actually submit another story idea for the Troughton era. The Harvesters. It would have involved a species called the Masters, having conquered a purple planet, planning to pilot it to the solar system and dispatch their robos to invade Earth. The Doctor would have defeated them by scaring them off with footage of nuclear explosions. 
The production team of the time rejected it, but Ems did try redrafting and resubmitting it for the Pertwee era as the Vampire Planet, where it was briefly considered to be the finale of Season 7, but, you know, ultimately it was scrapped and, you know, Inferno was put in its place, and rightfully so, because Inferno is amazing, while that just sounds like an utterly terrible, stupid runaround idea. Anyway, one of the submission for Season 6 was by the writing duo Henry Lincoln and Mervyn Hazeman, possibly a six-parter and possibly organised to be the penultimate adventure of the run, The Laird of McCrimmon. The plot would have continued the Doctor's feud with the Great Intelligence, who returns and possesses Jamie and controls him to pilot the TARDIS back in time to his ancestral home, a castle where the current Laird is dying. The Intelligence begins surrounding the castle with Yeti and starts possessing the inhabitants, with the ultimate goal of taking Jamie over permanently and becoming Laird himself. After its defeat, Jamie would have decided to depart from the Doctor's company and stay behind to become Laird, along with a woman whom he has fallen in love with. So yes, obviously this premise was another potential departure story for Fraser Hines, and it sounds like a relatively decent idea for a third Yeti story, and it sounds like it would have continued the trend of the Great Intelligence's wrongdoings hitting surprisingly close to home for the Doctor. That said, I do think Jamie's ultimate departure in the War Games is wonderfully soul-crushing, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So if I were to have this adventure exist in place of the penultimate Season 6 story, which would mean eliminating... Wait, let me check here. Um, the Space Pirates? Yeah, chuck that one out. But yeah, if I were to have the Lead of McCrimmon exist, I'd alter the premise so that Jamie still stays onto the war games regardless. Maybe he could consider leaving and ultimately decide against it, in favour of wanting more happy memories with the Doctor. Ouch. So, why didn't this story go ahead? Well, I elaborate on this in my Overlooked Writers video for Lincoln and Hazeman, but basically they felt the BBC was treating them unfairly during production of The Dominators, particularly when a dispute erupted between the writing pair and the company over copyright of the Quarks, and the resulting bad blood led to Lincoln and Hazeman distancing themselves from the show forevermore and cancelling any future plans they had for it, therefore banishing the lead of McCrimmon to production purgatory. A bit of a shame, as I can never say no to more Yeti, but... You know, it is what it is. And to round this Lost Stories analysis off, a double whammy, because these two kind of go hand in hand with each other. The Impersonators, a six-part outing by Malcolm Hulk, at one point planned to be the penultimate serial of a season, and another unnamed four-part story by Derek Sherwin following on to close off the season, the Second Doctor's tenure, and the 60s as a whole. All that is known of either of these two stories is that the latter would have ended with the second Doctor being stranded on Earth, akin to what actually happens in the Pertwee era. The Impersonators itself is shrouded in mystery, as we have no idea what it was going to actually be about. But either way, its abandonment for unknown reasons left space and budget for the other story to be extended to a 10 episode slot, and you can probably see where this is going. Thus, Sherwin's studio-bound four-part baby was expanded into Terence Dix and Malcolm Hogg's collaborative of sprawling epic The War Games, and I wouldn't have it any other way. This was definitely the correct move to make. Few stories feel as action-packed and as satisfactorily conclusive as The War Games does, and the sacrifice of its two forebears made it totally worth it. So in conclusion, Season 6 has by far the strongest lost story ideas of the entire Second Doctor era, and there are a couple which I wouldn't mind existing in place of what we actually got. I mean, I thoroughly enjoy the Crotons, but I wouldn't mind the Rose Mariners in its place, if you know what I mean. And, you know, the space parts is so terrible, just put Lords of the Red Planet or the Lead of McCrimmon in its place. But as for everything else, yeah, they're where they deserve to be, especially the prison in space. And so that brings this second Doctor Lost Story retrospective to a conclusion. Now I'm bad at signing off, but... To answer my initial question, I suppose the second Doctor's era could have been a smidgen better. There's always room for improvement. But his era is already so close to perfect anyway, so like, who cares?